Um, a 10,000 foot view of the consumer side of VR and AR is a very difficult topic to cover in 15 minutes. Um, however, uh, as a New Yorker, I talk very fast and uh, I'm gonna try not to read uh, my slides but to give my commentary over them. Um, one thing about me that you can probably see is that I'm not a young guy anymore. I'm not one of the young guys. Um, but uh, I have seen some things that are very relevant to what's happening today. And the first thing is not uh, computers or the cell phones. The first thing was uh, recording devices. So you know, it wasn't until the late 60s that we could record music that we liked. And uh, we used to listen to our favorite songs on the radio and record them on uh, eight track cassettes, uh, which are giant versions of the uh, audio cassettes that uh, of course are totally obsolete now. Uh, and you know, soon after that, 10 years after that, we were able to record uh, television. And uh, that was very significant. So, uh, and there's a business school study uh, that has to do with uh, Betamax and VHS. Betamax was the better platform, platform, yet VHS is the platform that won. It's also a lesson because often in consumer products, you're only gonna have one winner or two winners, Android and the iPhone, the I iOS. Um, the, uh, so in addition to smartphones, obviously I saw uh, the PC revolution, so, um, or the adoption of PCs and, and saw its inflection point in the 90s when I was working at a uh, America Online. Um, so uh, a few things that I know uh, are true, um, uh, among other things, uh, what we lack for these new platforms is killer apps. And what are killer apps? Um, you know, they are uh, the things that we are already doing made better, cheaper, and faster. Um, it has been said by Tim Merrill that it's uh, of DigiCapital. Uh, he's one of the leading analysts in our industry, uh, that it's all about the guys at the top of the pyramid. And uh, that could not be more true because we are really little pilot fish swimming along on the, uh, at the side of giants. Um, Microsoft uh, you know, is here at the conference. Uh, they're talking about something called uh, Microsoft MR, not VR. Uh, one of the interesting things about this industry is that it's moving so quickly that a presentation made two weeks ago is obsolete in some way because of um, Facebook and Google developer conferences and some significant announcements that were made there, uh, not the least of which is Microsoft is doing a standalone, um, fully immersed uh, VR headset for Daydream with Google, Lenovo, I believe, is also making one, uh, and it's going to be a plug-and-play device uh, using the Daydream Store and uh, Android software uh, running on a wearable computer, essentially, and uh, that is very significant because there is no plug-and-play VR product right now, uh, and that is what you need to penetrate the consumer market. Um, you know, the Vive is not a consumer uh, is is not a consumer product. You know, it's a product for specialty. Uh, hobbyists and, and some gamers, um, but uh, you're not going to take one under the tree and just plug it into your computer, uh, which Microsoft uh, is saying we will be able to do with Microsoft MR. In fact, they're saying that they've figured out a way to run significant graphics over existing Intel chipsets, which is significant. Again, today, if you're using a Vive, you're using the Rift, you need a high-end uh, NVIDIA chip. Uh, I believe it's the GT760 uh, uh, or above. Uh, and those are expensive. So uh, it's not really a consumer product. Um, there's some terrific products uh, on the horizon and some significant known unknowns, uh, the uh, most interesting of which is Magic Leap, which has over a billion, raised over a billion dollars uh, from media partners like Disney and Fox, as well as from Google, who put in $400 million, which is a pretty significant venture investment. We don't know much about Magic Leap, it uses light field technology, uh, which is different uh, than the HoloLens and uh, the Copen product, uh, which use um, uh, different methods to uh, allow you to view holograms. Um, Apple has yet to make an announcement. This is a big known unknown. Uh, I believe uh, the consensus is that Apple will probably announce um, an upgrade uh, to its next uh, version, which would be um, iPhone 8, uh, and it will have uh, 3D graphical capabilities and stereoscopic, 
cameras that can you know match depth and do facial recognition and basically do enhanced handheld computing. Uh, soon after that, I believe they will announce a product uh, I'm calling, <laughs> for want of a better word, the eyeglasses. Um, and that is essentially a um, Apple Watch on your face. I think it's a natural progression for them. I talked again about Microsoft, and uh, you know, then there are these dark horses out there, the people who are filling uh, the room in there. And I have to believe, honestly, that most of these are niche products that we pr probably won't be around in a few years. Right now, there are many that are being customized for uh, enterprise. Um, so they may survive, but again, it's about the big guys. I will say ODG has an awfully interesting uh, wearable computer, the R8, that is priced under $1,000 and is going to market in China, not the US, in the fourth quarter of this year with their partner, Megu, uh, who sells uh, cellular phones in China. Um, so uh, that's something to watch and, and could be significant. Um, this is a slide we've all seen a million times. Um, change starts out very slowly, um, and then uh, everybody has it all of a sudden. Uh, think about smartphones, think about personal computers. And uh, the adoption of those early devices and the inflection point all came with the introduction of killer apps. What are killer apps? Those are the apps that take the things we're already doing and make them better, faster, and cheaper. Um, so smartphones made email better, made messaging better, uh, made uh, digital photography better, made social media better. Um, so you had to have one, even though they cost, uh, especially the early models, uh, up to $1,000. Uh, the personal computer, which was in the mid-90s a product that was also $1,000. But eventually, people had email at work, they had to have it at home, uh, and uh, they, uh, even though we were using, you know, uh, you know, 2,800 baud modems, which, you know, caused web pages to rise uh, like islands from the sea uh, over, uh, you know, what seemed like uh, hours sometimes. Um, this is another slide that you probably have seen, and, and I, what I would say about this conference and VR and AR in general is that it takes an ecosystem to make a consumer product. The iPhone didn't take off until they opened uh, up their STK to third-party developers. And then Google and other people made you know, fantastic apps that made the iPhone something that you had to have. Um, and we're seeing in this industry uh, that ecosystem uh, evolving. Uh, on my uh, post on Forbes last night, I said, um, you can't have content without the tools to make the content. This conference is about the tools, really. It's not about consumer products. It's not about um, what somebody would do. It's the platform and the ecosystem you need to make those killer apps. And you know that's definitively happening. There's venture capital flowing into these tool makers and, and developers. So I think uh, we'll be talking about consumers a lot more next year and especially the year after that. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide. Uh, I don't have uh, a lot to say about this. Most people don't know about VR and AR. Of course, everybody you know knows about it, but the people who will buy things from you do not know about it. Um, so uh, the other thing about this conference, and again, I won't say much about this slide, um, enterprise goes first, right? I mean, the military could afford really, really cool shit that, you know, it's going to take 10 years to get into consumer markets. Um, the medical field uh, is used to paying six figures for equipment. and. Uh, this is not that expensive. So, uh, and surgeons have been complaining for years about uh, living in a monitor-rich environment, which is visually poor. So they have all the data, but they have to keep looking away from the patient and relying on other people to keep their eye on data like vital signs. And obviously, AR is a fantastic solution to that problem and will penetrate uh, that market probably uh, most significantly and most quickly. Um, in terms of what's out there in the market, and I'm talking here a little bit about hardware, but a lot about content. 360 video, uh, apologies to any uh, uh, immersive producers in the room, 360 video is not VR. You don't need a headset to look at it. You can, it's perfectly fine on your PC. Um, and, uh, but uh, these platforms, uh, you know, such as Google Cardboard, of which there are 20 million out there, are hungry. They are hungry for content. And there are bandwidth issues with transmitting digital 
uh, environments and, and allowing people inside of them to move around with low latency. Uh, so um, 360 video is the solution. Um, I'll talk in the next slide a little more about 360 video, which is really right now the dominant content uh, for the VR platform. Uh, the dream of VR, of course, is total immersion in a digital world where you're free to move around. Um, you have, you know, full field of vision, uh, your hands appear and move naturally, uh, and, and we're seeing some of that, uh, you know, from Vive and Oculus, uh, but it's really just the beginning. Um, we don't have haptics yet, uh, accessories get added and they're expensive, uh, and, um, and then AR on the consumer side right now is going to be uh, mobile driven. I mean, you're not going to see people wearing headsets. I don't think the snap specs are VR or AR. Um, the, um, just to talk a little bit more about 360 video, we're seeing some great products come out that turn your um, smartphone into a 360 degree video camera. Uh, and uh, of course, um, Facebook is now supporting it, as well as YouTube is supporting 360 video. I think it's going to catch on with consumers. Uh, it takes what they're already doing and makes it faster, better, and cheaper. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit uh, about this slide, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, we see uh, home systems, Google Daydream is around 200,000 and cardboard is not on this list. There are 20 million um, versions of cardboard out there, which is really, really significant. On the other hand, the content that people get exposed to through cardboard is meh. Um, so what's the path to success, right? I mean, what are the obstacles that home VR uh, has to overcome? And the number one problem is the cost, and the number two problem is that it's not plug and play. Uh, so, you know, how are those problems going to get solved? Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about what HTC's strategy is. They've been the most transparent uh, about their strategy, and um, they recognize these problems. And as I said earlier, they recognize that the Vive is not going to catch on as a consumer product for all of the reasons that I stated before. And therefore, they're starting a new Android-driven product line. Very smart. Um, you know, the explode, exposure problem they're uh, addressing through um, uh, 10,000 VRCades in China and uh, robust support for VRCades around the world. Uh, so people may be exposed to VR in public places uh, and uh, also experience franchise titles. Uh, VR is much better as an attended experience in a public place. Uh, you know, they're nurturing developers, they're trying to support the ecosystem with venture capital, and, um, you know, they're improving on Viveport and offering a low cost subscription. Uh, I want to talk about location uh, based entertainment for a second, um, Steve Dan, uh, who is creating software for TikTok Unlock, uh, which is an LBE in England that has multiple locations, uh, is going to come up after me. Uh, I, the one thing I will say uh, about this category is that uh, it is quite amazing. And the things people will see in public are things that they won't be able to do at home. As I said, the Vive is a better attended experience. They help you put on the headset. They've already downloaded the software. They tell you what to do. Um, you know, it's a great experience. You pay 10 bucks and you walk away. You haven't spent $2,000 in 20 hours setting the thing up. Uh, free roam VR is true VR. You put on a headset, you have a backpack uh, PC, uh, it's wireless, you walk around in a warehouse size room, uh, and it's a fully immersive digital environment. Uh, you know, I've done most of them, uh, including The Void, which has a, an experience called Ghostbusters. It's based on the movie. Movie franchises are going to be important here because you know what world you're going into and you know uh, what to do when you get there. Uh, Dreamscape is opening in October I ha in uh, LA. I have seen their demo and it is amazing. It is truly cinematic VR. But uh, let me say this about VR in public spaces, since I ran uh, a company uh, in the 90s that used simulators to network people together in a virtual world. In fact, it was called Virtual World. Um, some of you may remember it. Uh, it was around for about 10 years uh, until it became obsolete. Dave & Buster's was running it for a while. Um, but uh, why did VR in the 90s fail? Well, the equipment was expensive and real estate was more expensive. There is more real estate mall real estate available at more advantageous prices, but the most uh, significant problem was the cost of the equipment was extremely high, and you know, it cost for one of those virtual reality machines, virtuality machines that played Dactyl Nightmare, which was a horrible game, um, 
you know, cost $60,000. And at a dollar a minute, you're never going to make $60,000 back. Um, there are mundane realities to retail. Uh, you have too many seats on Saturday. Uh, you have too few seats on Saturday night. You have too many seats the rest of the time. Um, so utilization is a really, really big problem for public space VR. It's not like a movie theater where you take 15 bucks from somebody and they sit in a room with 300 people in 1,000 locations around the country or uh, 3,000 locations around the world. That's not how it works. So you have severe throughput limitations. And at the same time, you have high labor costs, you have real estate costs, and significantly, you have marketing costs. How are you going to market, market a single location if you're an entrepreneur who's set up a VRcade, let's say, in Brooklyn? Um, so there are severe challenges. And then how do you update the software? Again, if, you're, if it's Vive-based, HTC is providing a great suite of VRcade um, optimized content. Um, through their uh, partnerships with their developers. Uh, so it remains to be seen. The, the best uh, VR may not be the VR that wins in this space, number one. And let's not forget, the home uh, adoption and the quality of home and standalone VR is going to improve. And that's going to diminish the value of the location-based VR and cause them to do a significant software upgrade if they can survive that long. So the mundane reality of uh, retail has not changed, and, and the gravity of it is very hard to escape, even for the best and most interesting technology. So uh, I'm going to wrap up with a few predictions about what I think um, the balance of 2017, which is half over, and uh, 2018 are going to bring us. Um, again, without killer apps, uh, we're not going to hit an inflection point. Uh, as I said, 360 video. Uh, is something we'll see a lot more of. Um, the uh, handheld AR will start to uh, take off uh, with the introductions of new, as new handsets um, replace the old. Um, I think uh, Apple is going to make a significant announcement this year that is going to impact everybody in this industry. Uh, we talked about um, location-based and, and the known unknowns. So just for fun, let's talk about 10 years from now. Uh, well, first of all, this is going to be a much bigger room and a much bigger conference. Um, you know, there will be AR and VR capability in almost all of our devices, and, and many people will be wearing computers for different purposes, uh, including mundane ones like, um, you know, doing email and uh, watching uh, videos. I do think we've talked a lot at this conference about the social impact of VR, and, um, and I would include with that the... the uh, its twin sisters, uh, AI and IoT, which all rely on similar technology and bandwidth uh, and intelligent computers and computer learning. Um, this technology is going to put tens of millions of people out of work in the next 10 years. It is going to be a severe disruption to American society. Uh, the number one occupation uh, in this country is truck driver. Uh, and long-haul trucks can get in a little line on the right side of the in in interstate and today very easily drive from point to point without drivers. So drivers will only be required for the last mile. Uh, at the grocery store, you see your checkers disappearing. Uh, you know, this is all the result of technology. And a lot of the money that's being saved flows to those companies that implemented these systems, but it also flows to people like us. And it also flows to places like North Northern California. So the flight of capital... Uh, from the middle class to uh, the technical class uh, and the upper class who are uh, supporting the development of our amazing products um, is going to cause severe social dislocation. Uh, and so that can mean, uh, you know, a diminishing faith in democracy. Uh, you know, it can mean more Donald Trumps. Um, I do think it will also lead to uh, some good things because you'll have 60 million people who can't afford health insurance. So the dry, and, and by the way, you'll also have uh, 80 million people who are over the age of 60 who can't buy insurance on the open market. So there's no question there's going to be uh, changes in the social contract. Um, and um, so I don't know, I'm out of time, I think. Um, but uh, thank you all very much for listening. I'll be around. I'll be here during the break. Uh, I hope I have not told you uh, only things that you know, uh, but I suspect uh, everybody here had a, a, a good grasp on many of these pieces. So I thank you for listening to me, and I hope you have uh, a terrific day. <laughs>